Hello, welcome to Bible study. Glad you could join us today. Uh, we're looking this week at a passage out of Acts chapter 12, and uh, the title of this week's lesson for, the lesson for April the 11th is The Church is Sent to Trust God and to Demonstrate Before the World How We Are Trusting Him. There's a passage from Psalm uh, chapter 3 in that uh, a song has been written about called Thou, O Lord. It is sung, first of all, by the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. Our church choir sings this uh, sometimes, uh, and uh, it is a powerful, powerful passage. I want to read just a, a portion of this passage uh, today, and I hope that this will be a, a, an encouragement to you when uh, times of trouble may come our way, and we need to be reassured that God is hearing, that he's seeing, and that he is aware of what is going on in our lives. Psalm chapter 3, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept. I waked, for the Lord sustained me. The same kind of picture we're going to see here with Peter in Acts chapter 12. I laid me down and slept. I waked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. This is, uh, this is David writing this passage. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Wow, what a beautiful passage and an encouraging word uh, for us today. Uh, from that, we're going to move right into this passage uh, in Acts 12 and see how the Lord delivered Peter out of a prison cell when uh, death had all but been declared by uh, Herod for him uh, in that day and time. He was, uh, he'd been in jail for a few days, perhaps, and uh, he was probably scheduled to be executed the next day by an order for, uh, from Herod. So this is where we find ourselves the first part of our lesson uh, is titled Praying Fervently in a Time of Fear. Praying Fervently in a Time of Fear. Have you ever been in a fearful situation when you were afraid of, of what was happening right then or you were afraid of what might be coming and how in the world would you uh, be able to, to deal with that time when it came? Uh, Herod Agrippa uh, the first is the person who has uh, Peter thrown in jail here. He is the grandson of Herod the Great, who was the one who had all of the baby boys in Bethlehem put to death, uh, the ones who were under two years of age. You remember uh, Jesus had been born uh, about two years earlier, and uh, the angel came and appeared to Joseph and Mary and uh, said, uh, Herod is doing this, and because of this, you need to go to Egypt, take the baby Jesus and go to Egypt, uh, where you will be safe uh, for this time. So um, it, it was a period of, of great threatening, a period of great uh, danger for them uh, and for the, the baby Jesus. So here you have that Herod. Well, this is the grandson now of Herod the Great. Uh, Herod Antipas, who was his son, had already had John the Baptist beheaded. So the, the Herod dynasty was a, a terrible, terrible family. And they were determined to try to wipe out Christianity if they possibly uh, could at all. Uh, Herod had uh, Herod Antipas had already uh, executed James, who was the brother of John. Now there are two Jameses that were followers of Jesus that were part of his um, apost apostolic or disciple band. You had James the elder, and you had James the younger. Well, the James who has been executed already here is James uh, the elder. 
And um, he's the brother of John. John, the one Jesus loved, the one who wrote the Gospel of John uh, and, the, and the other letters of John. Uh, this was his brother, James, that Herod had already had uh, executed. They were sons of Zebedee, if you remember from from uh, Acts chapter 12, is where it's recorded that, that he had James uh, executed, had him killed. Uh, this was a season of unleavened bread where this particular uh, experience is happening with Peter here in Acts chapter 12. And you remember that uh, unleavened bread is a reminder to the Jewish people of God's deliverance of them from uh, from Egypt. And uh, they were to have the Passover, uh, put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts uh, of their houses. And the death angel was going to pass over uh, that land and the firstborn of all the land of Egypt were going to be killed. But the doorposts over the door uh, that was a, a symptom or a symbol, not a symptom, but a symbol that uh, these were God's people. These were Hebrews. These were ones who were believing God. And, uh, and, and the death angel would pass over uh, those houses. They were to have the Passover lamb. Uh, they were to eat it with unleavened bread. And then they were to leave very quickly out of Egypt, and they would be led by Moses across the Red Sea uh, and uh, get away from Pharaoh, who was certainly going to be in hot pursuit. So this is a, a one of those uh, celebrations that they had every year there in Jerusalem to remember God's deliverance for them uh, from Egypt. And uh, so Herod, uh, Herod Antipas had seen how uh, this pleased the 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 Herod family. The Herods were were terrible, and uh, uh, his killing and arresting of some of these disciples made the Pharisees very happy because they didn't like Jesus. They said he claims to be the Son of God, and uh, that's blasphemy. And we we need to kill him. We need to get rid of him. And in the process, uh, Herod said, "Well, I'll kill off his his followers." And uh, that'll that'll help the situation along too. That'll get rid of him, maybe uh, a, a little bit, or destroy Christianity even faster. Uh, we say, well, you know, if God is good, how does He allow these kinds of terrible things to happen? How does He allow uh, James to die, but He rescues Peter, as we're going to see that He does uh, in this passage? And it, it makes us come back to understand or try to understand uh, the sovereignty of God and, and his providence. I want to I read you uh, a doctrinal statement about God's providence, prayer and providence. What does prayer and the providence of God, you, some people say, well, if God already knows everything that, that he's going to do, if he already knows everything that's going to happen, uh, why do we need to pray? Well, th hopefully this statement will help us a little bit to, to understand and clarify that even more. If God is in control and already knows the future, why pray? The Bible teaches that although God has a plan for this world that he promises to fulfill, prayer is often the means God uses to accomplish his divine purpose. Even though God knows the end result, the means that lead to that end result will be accomplished through prayer. In this sense, it is true that prayer changes things. And it is also true that God uses prayer to change our hearts so that our will comes into conformity with his. Now, folks, uh, I hope you hear this. When we pray to God as believers, as folks who love the Lord, uh, and know him as Savior and Lord, when we pray, we need to be affirmed in our mind that God hears our prayers. God hears our prayers, and he answers our prayers. Now, you say, well, well I've prayed about some things that hey, God didn't answer. Sure he did. Sometimes his answer is no. Sometimes it's uh, yes. And sometimes his answer is not right now not right now. I have my plan, 
and and his plans, his ways are not our ways, and uh, his knowledge is not always our knowledge. It is sometimes through prayer that God helps us to understand the bigger picture. God has the picture from beginning to end. He created this world. It won't end until he's ready for it to end. And by his command, it came into being. By his command, it will come to an end. And and we're our finite minds are not able to take it all in. Oh, we have his word, and he tells us to read his word and to let his Holy Spirit uh, teach us and instruct us in his word. Uh, but there are times when we it's just a little beyond our comprehension, and so that's where trust and faith come in. Trust and faith uh, in a God that that we cannot see, but who makes His promises and shows us His answers. We have so many, so many evidences. We have seen so many answers uh, to the prayers that we have prayed to God that give testimony to the fact that he is at work. So when we when we see these kinds of things like what we see here in Acts chapter 12, uh, it should make us not question God, but to help us to understand how God is at work and what God ultimately uh, is doing to fulfill his plan and his purpose. Two things also to, to consider in this. When we say God is good and we say, well, well, you know, why do these things happen if God is good? Remember this, God limits evil. God limits evil and he limits the power of Satan and evil. You remember Job? Uh, when God said, consider my servant Job, uh, he's the best man on earth. In order to tempt Job and to test Job, uh, Satan had to get permission from God to be able to do that. So when we are being tempted, we are being tested. It is not without God's knowledge. That ought to give us some comfort. It ought to give us some reassurance that God certainly knows the dilemma that I'm facing. He certainly knows the problem that I have. He knows what I need help with right now. And, and just remember that evil and Satan are limited by God. Secondly, God works all things together for good. God works all things together for good. And you say, oh, I can't see how any good could have come out of this thing. Well, his word tells us that in all things, God works for good to those who believe him, to those who uh, are trusting in him. And uh, so that's one of those things, again, where we have to, uh, by faith, uh, put our trust in him who died for our sins and who promises us eternal life because of his death and resurrection uh, from the dead. Well, uh, the second part of this passage comes from verses 6 through 11, Acts 12, 6 through 11. On the night before Herod was to bring him out for execution. Now that tells you it's going to be the next day that, that Herod was going to, he probably going to behead him. Uh, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains while the sentries in front of the door guarded the prison. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell, striking Peter on the side. He woke him up and said, quick, get up. Then the chains fell off his wrist. Get dressed, the angel told him, and put on your sandals. He did so. Wrap your cloak around you, he said, and follow me. So he went out and followed, and he did not know what took place through the angel was real but thought he was seeing a vision. After they passed the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them by itself. They went outside and passed one street, and immediately the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's grasp and from all that the Jewish people had expected. Herod had Peter in a maximum security cell in the depths of the prison. Uh, and, and Peter was sleeping. He was sound asleep. Uh, he wasn't sitting there uh, fretting and, and wondering. And, and I'm sure he'd already prayed. He probably prayed himself to sleep. But he was not worrying. That's, that's important. Uh, and... Uh, 
you know, he's, he's in big trouble, as we would say today, or so it would appear to us. But, but Peter is not troubled. That demonstrates the depth of his faith here. And, and while he's asleep, it's about 2 o'clock in the morning, an angel comes in the cell, has to poke Peter on the side and say, wake up, <laughs> get up. Uh, and uh, he tells him even how to get dressed. He said, well, you get up, put your clothes on, put your sandals on, put your coat on. And you think, well, why did the angel have to give, why did the scripture record that the angel is telling Peter how to get up and get dressed? I guarantee you, for the rest of Peter's life, and Peter's going to live to be an old man. Uh, every time he put on his sandals, he's going to remember this night in that prison cell. Every time he picks up his cloak, his coat, every time he gets gets up and put it puts it on, he's going to remember this night in that prison cell. So uh, sometimes the things that seem rather incidental and mundane to us have powerful meaning uh, in the days that will lie ahead. Um, uh, what what experiences have you had that affirm in your heart that God is at work, that he has been at work, that he is still at work? Oh, my friends, I, I, have, I wish I could take time to tell you some stories of ways that I have seen myself, seen God at work, and how he has demonstrated that he knows, he sees, and he does what he will do to help us in times of distress. Well, the third part of this lesson comes from Acts chapter 12, uh, verses uh, 12 through 17. When he realized this, he realized that, you know, this is real. Uh, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many had assembled and were praying. Now, uh, th this is Mark who wrote uh, uh, one of the Gospels, one of the four Gospels, and it was in his mother's house that uh, the, the early church of that day in Jerusalem would often assemble, particularly those who were closest to Jesus, uh, would assemble in, in that home. And that's where the church was. There were a bunch of folks there, and they were praying. What were they praying for? They were praying for Peter and for his uh, safe release because uh, I'm sure they'd already heard that Peter was to be executed the next day. And, uh, and here is Peter, and he goes to the house. He could have taken off running. Uh, you know, he said, man, I'm free. I'm going to get out of the city. I'm going to get away from here. No. What did he do? He went to church. Why? Because he knew that the church was down there on their knees praying for them, and he wanted them to know he'd been set free. So here he is, and he's knocking at the door. And Rhoda, a servant girl, came to answer. She recognized Peter's voice. And because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the gate. Can you imagine this? Here's this young lady, and, and she hears Peter knocking on the door, and, and she goes to the door. She probably had a peephole in it. She opens that peephole, and she, she looks through there, and she sees Peter. And, and Peter says, she recognized his voice, so Peter had to speak to her and said, It's me. I'm, I'm Peter. I'm here. And so <laughs> she's so excited. She turns around and runs back to tell the church, tell the rest of the people, hey, it's Peter, he's here. Uh, and she didn't even open the door and let him in. So uh, they, a bunch of them then go to the door. Uh, perhaps they didn't know quite what to expect. They didn't know whether it was going to be Peter by himself. They didn't know whether it was going to be uh, Peter with a bunch of uh, Roman guards or there, and then he's going to burst in and uh, arrest or kill other people in the church. They didn't know. So here they are, they all go together, and Peter comes in, and, um, and, and well, they told her first that she was crazy, but they kept, but she kept insisting that it was true, and they said, it's his angel. Peter, however, kept on knocking. When they opened the door and saw him, they were astounded. They were astounded. Isn't that funny? Uh, a lot of times when, when God does answer our prayer, yeah, we're astounded. When we pray and we, we tell God what we need, and he's listening, and then he answers the prayer, and we're astounded. Well, hey, we can't blame them for being astounded. We're just as astounded sometimes as they were. Uh, report these things to James and the brothers. That's, that's James the younger. And uh, tell the, the disciples who were not there. Some of them were not. He said, then he departed and went to a different place. Now, we don't know where Peter went from, from that night. 
Uh, the scripture doesn't tell us. We know that he was alive for many years. He was involved in uh, missionary journeys just like Paul was. But from this point on, the focus of the book of Acts is going to be more on Paul and his missionary journeys than it is on Peter. So uh, uh, anyway, this is this is what happened. This is the, when when Peter was uh, set free uh, on that night. Um, what should we say to a person who has been faithfully praying over a matter for some time, and it doesn't appear appear that God has answered to that person? What should we say to a person in that kind? A situation. How can we help them to be strengthened in their faith in a time like this? Well, we can point scripture to them to show that God does hear our prayers and that he does answer and that sometimes it may be soon that we will see that answer. Sometimes it may just be no, because this is not the right thing for God, for that person and his plan uh, for their life. Well, um, Thomas Watson, who was a Puritan preacher of another day, uh, makes a comment about this passage. He said, the angel fetched Peter out of prison, but it was prayer that fetched the angel. It was God who set Peter free because he had a great work yet for Peter to do and God accomplished exactly what he wanted to do through the life of Peter. I pray that as you are, are praying over issues that may be going on in your life or in the life of some friend or family member, I pray that uh, you will see God's hand at work and that God will show you at least a portion of his plan so that you can understand why and how things are working like they are in your life. God loves you. God loves you. Jesus died for you. He was resurrected from the grave. He's coming again one of these days. Oh, what a wonderful day that will be. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. For this lesson in faith, this lesson in prayer, this lesson to the church about how to be persistent in praying over matters that are of great importance to us and to your kingdom's sake. Help us, Lord, to believe and to understand uh, the fact that you are indeed at work in this world, even when we can't see it, Lord. It's your world, and Lord, Satan will not prevail. Jesus has already defeated him. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.